Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to The Meaning of Catholic. For those of you tuning in for the first time, my name is Nicholas Cavazos, a.k.a. the traditional Thomist. Jesus is King. Howdy, everyone. It's good to have you here on The Meaning of Catholic. Today is the third Sunday of Advent. Time is flying by, right? It is Gaugete Sunday. It is one of uh, my favorite Sundays of the year, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but first, happy Advent. We are really in the, the middle of the throes, in the, the middle of the deep winter, if you will, of the Advent season. And so I'm hoping that during this time, right, as you've been going through Advent, since we're three weeks into it, that you would have found uh, resolutions, right, holy aspirations, things along that nature in which to um, aspire to, right, things to fast over things to or fast from rather things to meditate on um, deep truths of the incarnation as of the mysteries of christ some of the things that we talked about in last week's introduction these realities are important for us to meditate on in this day and age i'm going to be diving into as i we began three or i guess three weeks ago now this series on the sunday sermons of saint alphonsus Liguori, and thus far we've looked at two important themes. The first Sunday, we looked at the reality of the general judgment, right? That great judgment where Christ enthroned in all of his glory will judge the living and the dead, right? He will give to everyone the uh, the just recompense for their errors, or he will give to the righteous, right? To the blessed, to the elect, to the saints, the glories of heaven, right? Being his own person, right? Being God, being the ultimate reward. And then last week, we talked a bit about the reality of great tribulation, right? The great tribulations that a Christian will suffer in his lifetime, not the great tribulation that you see in the book of the apocalypse, but the great tribulation of what it means to be a Christian, the suffers, uh, the suffering, the temptations, the persecutions that one receives in his life. And boy, let me tell you, it was definitely a um, providential occurrence that I read through that sermon and actually went through this week uh, particularly because this week particularly for me, uh, it was a tough week in the sense that I've come under a lot of different persecutions uh, in the sense that I've recognized uh, as I've gotten older uh, and I just look around myself that there are many people who I grew up with right? Back in my Protestant days, right? For those of you who don't know, I'm a convert to Catholicism. Uh, and also uh, Catholics that I've known over these last three years of being Catholic, I've seen so many of them fall away from faith and have turned uh, away from the person of Jesus Christ and from Our Lady and have rather turned to the devil in a lot of ways, turned to the devil in the context of falling into the errors of wokeism or falling to the errors uh, of atheism, right? Agnosticism, secularism, etc., some falling to modernism as well. And because of these things, uh, I often find myself, um, number one, becoming very sad about these realities. But the number two, I find myself also receiving, uh, I guess in reverse, um, their angst, their anger, their their vengeance, if you will, in the sense that um, many times uh, if you come from Christianity to something else, uh, generally speaking, 99 times out of 100, you're probably not going to be uh, very kind to any mention of the person of Christ. This being the case, uh, what we're going to be diving into today, right, is something that is really building on these two themes that we've seen in these two sermons. We're going to be talking specifically about the means necessary for salvation. Uh, in other words, um, looking at more of the finer points as well as the really good practical realities of what is needed for our salvation. So as always, right, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be diving into specifically, right, the liturgical readings of the year, right, again for this third Sunday of Advent, right, with the commentary given by Dom Gaspar Lefebvre, right, this is just a great missile, right, the St. Andrew's Daily Missile. I love the, that missile. I honestly think it's one of the best just because of the great commentary that you receive from it. We're going to be diving into that, and then we're going to be diving into the sermon by St. Alphonse Liguori, and then we're going to be diving into just some of my thoughts and exhortation to you, right, the viewer, from your brother in Christ, yours truly. All right, so without any further ado, let us go ahead and dive in. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 
O Mary, by thy pure and immaculate conception, keep my body pure and my soul holy, and preserve me this night free from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, by thy pure and immaculate conception, keep my body pure and my soul holy, and preserve me this night free from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, by thy pure and immaculate conception, keep my body pure and my soul holy, and preserve me this night free from mortal sin. Prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas for light and guidance. O ineffable Creator, who, out of the abundance of thy wisdom, hast constituted the three angelic hierarchies, and hast set them in amiable order over the highest heaven, thou, who hast most graciously proportioned the ports of heaven, thou, who art called the true font of light and wisdom, and the first beginning of all, begin to let the beam of thy splendor shine upon the darkness of my intellect, to dispel the twofold gloom of sin and ignorance in which I was born. Make my tongue to speak wise things, O thou who makest eloquent the tongues of babes, and do thou pour out upon my lips the grace of thy benediction. Give me keenness of comprehension, ability to retain, method and ease in acquiring, precision in interpreting, plenteous grace in speaking. Inspire my going in, guide my steps when I walk, and my going out do thou make perfect. Thou who art once God and man, and who reignest forever and ever. Amen. Prayer to St. Thomas Aquinas O blessed Thomas, patron of schools, obtain for us from God an ineffable, an invincible faith, a burning charity, a chaste life, a true knowledge, through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Alphonsus de Liguori, pray for us. St. Dominic, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Third Sunday of Advent I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord is now at hand. Come, let us adore him. The First Coming it is Mary who gives us Jesus, quote, Blessed art thou, Mary, whose things shall be accomplished in thee, which were spoken to thee by the Lord, end quote, taken from the antiphon of the Magnificat. It is from Bethlehem that the king, the ruler, shall go forth, who is to bring peace to all the nations, and who will deliver his people from the power of their enemies, as in the fourth response. In this special way, our souls will share in the deliverance during Christmas celebrations, which will mark the anniversary of the entrance into the world of Christ, the vanquisher of Satan. Quote, Grant, we beseech thee, the church says, that the new birth of thine only begotten Son may set us free, whom the old bondage doth hinder the yoke of sin, End quote. as taken from the third Mass of Christmas Day. In the same way that St. John the Baptist prepares the Jews for the coming of the Messiah, so he prepares us for the union closer every year, which our Lord forms within our souls at Christmas. Quote, Make straight the way of the Lord, cried the forerunner of Christ. So let us make straight the way into our hearts. Let our Savior may enter and give us his graces of life and freedom. The Second Coming it is to our Lord's coming at the end of the world, says St. Gregory, alludes in his explanation of the gospel, quote, John, he says, the forerunner of the Redeemer goes before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elias, who will be the forerunner of Christ as judge, end quote, taken from the ninth lesson of Martins. So also in the introit and the epistle, taken literally, the illusion is of our Lord coming for judgment. If we feel great joy at the approach of the Christmas feast, reminding us once more of his lowly infant in the manger, how much more should we, through his coming, 
and all splendor of his power and majesty fill us with the holy sense of triumph, since only then will our redemption be truly accomplished. St. Paul writes to the Christians, quote, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. The Lord is nigh, end quote. As on the Mid-Lent Sunday, the priest may celebrate in rose-colored vestments. Rose is a paler kind of violet. It expresses some relaxation in penance, owing to the joy of the heavenly Jerusalem into which our Lord will lead us when time shall be no more. Quote, Rejoice, O Jerusalem, with great joy, for there shall come unto thee a Savior. As says the second antiphon of Vespers. Let us greatly desire this coming, which the Apostle tells us is near. We should long with a holy impatience that it may quickly come to pass. Quote, Stir up, O Lord, thy might, and come to save us. End quote. Taken from the Alleluia. Come, Lord, and tarry not. Per adventum tuum libera nos domini. Every parish priest shall say Mass for his parish. The station for this Sunday is the Basilica of St. Peter's. The Uintrit of the Mass Taken from the Epistle of St. Paul to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. Commentary Jacob's race rescued from the captivity of Babylon is taken as a type of Christ's people, freed by him from the bondage of sin. The Intuit Quote, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Let your modesty be known to all men, for the Lord is nigh. Be nothing solicitous, but be in everything. By prayer, let your petitions be made known to God. Thou hast blessed thy land. Thou hast turned away the captivity of Jacob. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Let your modesty be known to all men, for the Lord is nigh. Be nothing solicitous, but in everything by prayer let your petitions be made known to God. The Collect. Quote, Incline thine ear to our prayers, we beseech thee, O Lord, and enlighten the darkness of our minds by the grace of thy visitation, who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Ghost, God world without end. Amen. The second collect, taken from the additional collects of the season, during Advent, of the Blessed Virgin. Quote, o God, who hast willed that thy word should take flesh at the message of an angel, in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, grant to us, thy servants, that we who believe her to be truly the mother of God may be helped by her intercession. Through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The Third Collect Against the Persecutors of the Church Quote, We beseech thee, O Lord, mercifully to receive the prayers of thy church, that all adversary and error may be destroyed, she may serve thee in security and freedom. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The Epistle Taken from St. Paul's Epistle to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4-7. through seven. Commentary St. Paul urges the faithful great to rejoice at the thought of the second coming of Christ for which Advent prepares us and makes us ready to keep the anniversary of his first coming. The Epistle A lesson from the Epistle of Blessed Paul the Apostle to the Philippians. Brethren, rejoice in the Lord, always. Again I say, rejoice. Let your modesty be known to all men. The Lord is nigh. Be nothing solicitous, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your petition be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasseth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Gradual, taken from Psalm 79, verses 2, 3. Commentary. Christ is the head of the church, foreshadowed by Israel and Joseph. The Gradual. 
Thou, O Lord, that sittest upon the cherubim, stir up thy might and come. Give ear, O that rulest Israel and leadest Joseph like a sheep. Alleluia, alleluia. Stir up, O Lord, thy might and come to save us. Alleluia. The Gospel, taken from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. Commentary. The Jews seek to know who John the Baptist really is, to whom the people are crowding at baptism. Quote, if you wish to know, Jesus already told them, John the Baptist is Elias, as is seen in St. Matthew, chapter 17, verse 13. There is here, St. Gregory explains, quote, no sort of contradiction of the words of St. John himself, for without being Elias in person, he has the power of the spirit of Elias and is the forerunner of Christ in his first coming, as Elias will be in his second coming, taken from the ninth lesson for Montans. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time, the Jews sent from Jerusalem priests and Levites to John to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed, and did not deny, and he confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou the prophet? He answered, No. They said therefore unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? And he sayest, What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord. As said the prophet Isaiah, And they that were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him, and said to him, why then dost thou baptize, if thou art not Christ, nor Elias, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there hath stood one in the midst of you, whom you know not, the same as he that shall come after me, who is prepared before men, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethany, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Offertory, taken from Psalm 79, verses 2 and 3. Lord, thou hast blessed thy land. Thou hast turned away the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. The Secret. May the sacrifice of our devotion, we beseech thee, O Lord, be always offered unto thee, that it may both fulfill the end for which thou didst institute the sacred mystery, and wonderfully to work in us thy salvation. To our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who liveth and reigneth with thee, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The Second Secret For the Blessed Virgin Mary We beseech thee, O Lord, to strengthen in our minds the mystery of the true faith, that we who confess him, who was conceived of the Virgin, may be true God and man, may by the power of his saving resurrection merit to attain eternal joy. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. The third secret against the persecutors of the church. Protect us, Lord, who assist at thy mysteries, that fixed upon things divine, we may serve thee in both body and mind, through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The communion verse, taken from Isaiah 35, verse 4. Say to the faint-hearted, Take courage and fear not. Behold, our God will come and will save us. Post-Communion We implore thy mercy, O Lord, that these divine mysteries, by atoning for our sins, may be prepared for us the coming of thy festival. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. The second post-communion for the Blessed Virgin Mary. For forth we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. The third collect, against the persecutors of the church. We beseech thee, O Lord, our God, that thou wouldest not suffer to be exposed to human dangers, those whom thou gavest to rejoice in this divine banquet. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. Sermon 3 For the third Sunday of Advent, 
on the means necessary for salvation. Quote, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. End quote. John chapter 1 verse 23. All would wish to be saved and to enjoy the glory of paradise. But to gain heaven, it is necessary to walk in the straight road that leads to eternal bliss. This road is the observance of the divine commands. Hence, in his preaching, the Baptist claimed, quote, make straight the way of the Lord, end quote. In order to be able to walk always in the way of the Lord, without turning to the right or to the left, it is necessary to adopt the proper means. These means are, first, diffidence in, of ourselves, secondly, confidence in God, thirdly, resistance to temptations. First means, diffidence in ourselves. Quote, With fear and trembling, says the apostle, work out your salvation, end quote. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. To secure eternal life, we must always penetrate with fear. We must always be afraid of ourselves with fear and trembling, and distrust altogether our own strength. For without the divine grace, we can do nothing. Quote, without me, says Jesus Christ, you can do nothing, end quote. We can do nothing for the salvation of our own souls. St. Paul tells us that of ourselves we are not capable of even a good thought. Quote, Not that we are sufficient to think any one of ourselves as ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. End quote. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Without the aid of the Holy Ghost, we cannot even pronounce the name of Jesus so as to deserve a reward. Quote, and no one can say the Lord Jesus but by the Holy Ghost, end quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. Miserable the man who trusts in himself in the way of God. St. Peter experienced this sad effect of self-confidence. Jesus Christ said to him, quote, In this night, before the cock crow, thou wilt deny me thrice, end quote. Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. Trusting in our own strength, and his good will. The apostle replied, quote, Yea, though I should die with thee, I will not deny thee. End quote. Verse 35. What was the result? On the night on which Jesus Christ had been taken, St. Peter was approached in the court of Caiaphas with being one of the disciples of our Savior. The reproach filled him with fear. He thrice denied his master and swore that he had never known him. Humility and diffidence in ourselves are so necessary for us that God p- permits us sometimes to fall into sin, that by our fall we may acquire humility, arid a knowledge of our own weakness. Through want of humility, David also fell. Hence, after his sin, he said, quote, Before I was humbled, I offended. End quote. Psalm chapter 118, verse 67. Hence, the Holy Ghost pronounces, Blessed the man who is always in fear. Quote, Blessed is the man who is always fearful. End quote. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 14. He who is afraid of falling distrusts his own strength, avoids as much as possible all dangerous occasions, and recommends himself often to God, and thus preserves his soul from sin. But the man who is not fearful but full of self-confidence, easily exposes himself to the danger of sin. He seldom recommends himself to God, and thus he falls. Let us imagine a person suspended over a great precipice by a cord held by another. Surely he would constantly cry out to the person who supports him, Hold fast! Hold fast! For God's sake, do not let go! We are all in danger of falling into the abyss of crime if God does not support us. Hence, we should constantly beseech him to keep his hands over us and to secure us from all danger. In rising from bed, St. Philip Neri used to say every morning, quote, Lord, keep thy hand this day over Philip. If thou do not, Philip will betray thee, end quote. And one day as he walked through the city, reflecting on his own misery, he frequently said, quote, I despair, I despair. End quote. 
a certain religious who heard him, believing that the saint was really tempted to despair, corrected him and encouraged him to hope in the divine mercy. But the saint replied, quote, I despair of myself, but I trust in God, end quote. Hence, during this life in which we are exposed to so many dangers of losing God, it is necessary for us to live always in great confidence of ourselves and of full confidence in God. The second means confidence in God. St. Francis de Sales says that the mere attention to self defidence on account of our own weakness would only render us pusillanimous and expose us to great danger of abandoning ourselves to a tepid life or even to despair. The more we distrust our own strength, the more we should confide in the divine mercy. This is a balance, says the same saint, in which the more the scale of confidence of God is raised, the more the scale of defidence in ourselves descends. Listen to me, O sinners, who have had the misfortune of having hitherto offended God and of being condemned to hell. If the devil tells you that but a little hope remains for your eternal salvation, answer him in the words of sacred scripture, quote, No one hath hoped in the Lord and hath been confounded, end quote. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11. No sinner has ever trusted in God and has been lost. Make then a firm purpose to sin no more. Abandon yourselves to the arms of the divine goodness, and rest assured that God will have mercy on you and will save you from hell. Quote, Cast thy care upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. End quote. Psalm chapter 104, verse 23. The Lord, as we read in Balsulius, one day said to St. Gertrude, quote, he who confides in me does me such violence that I cannot hear all his petitions, end quote. But, says the prophet Isaiah, they that hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall take wings as eagles. They shall run and shall not be weary. They shall walk and not faint, end quote. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. They who place their confidence in God shall renew their strength. They shall lay aside their own weakness and shall acquire the strength of God. They shall fly like eagles in the way of the Lord, without fatigue and without their failing. David says that, quote, mercy shall encompass him that hopeth in the Lord, end quote. Psalm chapter 31, verse 10. He that hopes in the Lord shall be encompassed by his mercy, so that he shall never be abandoned by it. St. Cyprian says that the divine mercy is an inexhaustible fountain. They who bring vessels of the greatest confidence draw from it the greatest graces. Hence, the royal prophet says, quote, Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us as we have hoped in thee. End quote. Psalm chapter 32, verse 22. Whenever the devil terrifies us by placing before our eyes the great difficulty of persevering in the grace of God in spite of all the dangers and sinful occasions of this life, let us, without answering him, raise our eyes to God and hope that in his goodness he will certainly send us help to resist every attack. Quote, I have lifted up mine eyes to the mountains from whence help shall come to me. End quote. Psalm chapter 120 verse 1. And when the enemy represents to us our weakness, let us say with the apostle, quote, I can do all in him who strengtheneth me, end quote. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Of myself I can do nothing, but I trust in God, that by his grace I shall be able to do all things. Hence, in the midst of the greatest dangers of perdition to which we are exposed, we should continually turn to Jesus Christ, and throwing ourselves into the hands of him who redeemed us by his death, should say, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, the God of truth. End quote. Psalm chapter 30, verse 6. This prayer should be said with the greatest confidence of obtaining eternal life, and it, to it, we should add, quote, In thee, O Lord, I have hoped. Let me not be confounded forever. End quote. Psalm chapter 30, verse 1. The third means resistance to temptations. 
It is true that when we have recourse to God with confidence in dangerous temptations, he assists us. But in certain very urgent occasions, the Lord sometimes wishes that we cooperate and do violence to ourselves to resist temptations. On such occasions, it will not be enough to have recourse to God once or twice. It will be necessary to multiply prayers and frequently to prostrate ourselves and send up our sighs before the image of the Blessed Virgin and the crucifix, crying out with tears, Mary, my mother, assist me. Jesus, my Savior, save me for thy mercy's sake. Do not abandon me. Do not permit me to lose thee. Let us keep in mind the words of the gospel, quote, how narrow is the gate, and straight is the way that leadeth to life, and few there are that findeth. End quote. Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. The way to heaven is straight and narrow. They who wish to arrive at this place of bliss by walking in the paths of pleasure shall be disappointed, and therefore few reach it, because few are willing to use violence to themselves in resisting temptations. Quote, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violence bear it away. End quote. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. In explaining this passage, a certain writer says, quote, It must be sought and obtained by violence. He who wishes to obtain it without inconvenience or by leading a soft and irregular life shall not acquire it, he shall be excluded from it. End quote. To save their souls, some of the saints have retired to the cloister. Some have confined themselves in a cave. Others have embraced torments and death. Quote, the violent bear it all away. End quote. Some complain of the want and confidence in God, but they do not perceive that their diffidence arises from the weakness of their resolution to serve God. St. Teresa used to say, quote, Oh, of irresolute souls, the devil has no fear. End quote. Wiseman has declared that, quote, Desire kills the slothful, end quote. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 25. Some would wish to be saved and to become saints, but never resolve to adapt the means of salvation, such as meditation, the frequent of the sacraments, detachment from creatures, or if they adopt these means, they shall soon give them up. In a word, they are satisfied with fruitless desires and thus continue to live in enmity with God, or at least in tepidity. Which is the end, which in the end leads them to the loss of God. Thus, in them are verified the words of the Holy Ghost: quote, "Desire kills the slothful." End quote. If then we wish to save our souls and to become saints, we must make a strong resolution, not only in general to give ourselves to God, but also in particular to adopt the proper means and to never abandon them after having once taken them up. Hence, we must never cease to pray to Jesus Christ and his Holy Mother for holy perseverance. O oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, and I detest all my sins because of thy just punishments, because I fear the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, but most of all because they have offended thee, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love. I firmly resolve with the help of thy grace to confess my sins, do penance, and to amend my life. Amen. Prayer to obtain final perseverance from Jesus and Mary. Eternal Father, I humbly adore and thank Thee for having created me and for having redeemed me by the means of Jesus Christ. I thank Thee for having made me a Christian by giving me the true faith and adopting me for Thy child in holy baptism. I thank Thee for having given me time for repentance after my many sins and for having, as I hope, pardon of all my offenses against Thee. O oh, infinite goodness, I thank Thee also for having preserved me from falling again as often as I should have done if Thou hadst not helped me up and saved me. But my enemies do not cease to fight against me, nor will they until death, that they may again have for me their slave. If thou dost not keep and help me continually by thy assistance, I shall be wretched enough to lose thy grace in you. I therefore pray thee, for the love of Jesus Christ, to grant me holy perseverance till death. Thy Son Jesus has promised that thou wilt grant us whatever we ask for, him, for us in his name. By the merits, then, of Jesus Christ, I beg thee for myself and for all those who are in thy grace, 
the grace of never more being separated from thy love, that we may always love thee in this life and the next. Mary, Mother of God, pray to Jesus for me. St. Alphonsus de Liguori, pray for us. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Dominic, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. What are the lessons that we can take away from this, my friends? We look at this saint, and we recognize that he gives us three considerations, right? Three considerations for our salvation. We have to have a holy distrust of self. What do we mean by that? He's not saying uh, like in a Kantian or in a um, rationalistic way, a Descartian way, if you will, to distrust our senses, right? To distrust those faculties, those physical, corporeal faculties that we take in information. Rather, what he's saying is not to trust oneself for salvation apart from God's grace. My friends, one of the greatest errors in the modern day Catholic Church that is not the fault of the Catholic Church, but is the fault of bad catechesis, is this error of Pelagianism, if you will, where many Catholics today really do think that they will be saved by just keeping the Ten Commandments or by being a good person or by just going to Holy Mass on Sundays, right? Rather than recognizing that they need God's grace. Many times people will take the Ten Commandments or Sunday Mass, etc., etc., and they will think of them in a box, if you will. And this box says, my works on it. And they think in their mind, if I do thus many good works, then this will cancel out my bad. My friends, for one mortal sin, you are damned to hell. That is the reality of mortal sin, is that you are choosing with your will some created being or some created thing that is less than God for which you are made for. Your will is made to be in union with God. But when we sin... We turn ourselves away from God, and apart from God's grace, we cannot attain eternal life. That is the reality that we have to recognize. The second consideration is that we need to trust in Christ, right? This is why it is so important, my friends, so important for us, regardless of where we're at in the spiritual life, to pray our morning prayers, to pray the morning acts of faith, hope, and charity asking God for final perseverance, praying frequently the act of contrition, we, re we must recognize that without God's grace, right, without the person of God, we will not be saved. We must have a holy abandonment to him. But this abandonment is not an abandonment of um, laxity, where one does not therefore strive by God's grace to correct one's life. If you recognize, my friends, that you are trapped in a sin, right? whether it be the sin of slothfulness, as he mentioned in this sermon, whether this be the sin of lust, whether this be the sin of pride, the sin of anger, right, the sin of envy, you fill in the blank. We have to recognize that it is only through the grace of Jesus Christ, right, given to us by the hands of Mary through the sacraments and through prayer, that we can be saved only through by God's grace. And the third thing we must recognize and do is that we also cannot therefore fall into right a, a spirit where it says, well, because God's grace can save me, therefore, right, I'll be good. I'll be fine. I don't need to worry about things. We have to persevere in holy hope. The virtue of hope is the great means between scrupulosity, right, that defect in the will, and that great other opposite error, presumption. We have to recognize that Christ died for mankind and that he wants us to be saved. Christ does not want you not to be saved. He wants you to be saved, right? Scripture is crystal clear on that. St. Paul's letter to Timothy is very clear that Christ died for all men and that he desires all to come to the knowledge of repentance. But this being the case, we also have to recognize that man has free will. And so this holy hope says, right, this hope that is, by God's grace, infused into your will through the sacrament of holy baptism, we have to recognize that while Christ died for us, that does not give us, therefore, a license to go sin, right? You should not sin. God forbid we must make a resolution to never sin again. 
But at the same time, we also have to recognize on the opposite extreme that we don't want to fall into this mentality of despair, right? As he mentioned, where we distrust not even just ourselves, but God, right? That is what despair is, is it's a distrust of the promises of God made to us in Holy Scripture, the promises which say, my grace is sufficient for thee. The promises that you see, for instance, in the epistle of 1 John, where it says, if we confess our sins, he, right, being Christ, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Run to the sacrament of confession. Run to the sacrament of penance, right? Remember that it is Christ in all of the sacraments who is trying to save you. But the question is, will we be receptive to it? So my challenge, my final thoughts, if you will, to you, as we close out on this third Sunday of Advent, is for you to recognize that as we, the church, right, the Catholic Church, meditate in this season on the anniversary of Christ's coming, as well as the reality that Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, that you would take this time and recognize Christ came to earth not so that man could just live a happy life on a natural level, but rather so that he could come and pay the price for our sins. How ought I to respond? And then coupled with that, the reality that Christ will come again. And as St. Matthew says in chapter 13, right, he will come in glory with his angels, and he will separate the chaff from the wheat. As he says in chapter 24, or excuse me, chapter 25 of St. Matthew's gospel, he will divide the sheep from the goats. We also see elsewhere in scripture this real reality of Christ separating the children of light from the children of darkness, right? That he will give to every man according to his works. What are, what are my resolutions going to be, therefore, growing forward? Am I going to be on the side of Christ, or am I going to be on the side of self, which is therefore, through fallen nature, the side of the devil? My encouragement for you all in this season is consider these things. Recognize that Christ loves you and has the graces necessary that will help you attain salvation. Don't despair. Don't give up hope, but choose to follow Christ in each and every way. All right, everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, I definitely enjoyed uh, making it with you, uh, if you will, uh, just speaking to you over the mic. Uh, go ahead and drop a like on this video. Make sure to also share it, right? Let's get this. Uh, let's get these sermons pumped up, if you will, in the sense of uh, out there so that people can also be exposed to these great words. And St. Alphonsus Liguori. If you're wanting to see more content with me, right, more specifically with the stuff that I'm involved in, link will be in the description below for the traditional Thomas, right, my own personal YouTube channel, right, where each and every week we go over subjects that range from Thomistic theology and philosophy, right? We're going to be going into a whole lot of new series in this upcoming year, right? We're going to be going into traditional Catholic dogmatic theology, right? So if you're wanting to figure out what do Catholics believe? What am I required to believe as a Catholic? What are all the proofs from our great tradition, history, and from Scripture that back up these things as well as natural proofs of reason? Go over there, right, if that's what you're interested in. We're also going to be having a huge series on Thomistic philosophy that's really going to be debunking the absolute idiocy that is atheism and agnosticism and skepticism. And then we're also going to be touching on all other kind of interesting controversial issues from the new mass to what Catholics can be doing nowadays in the context of supporting the Latin mass, all kinds of natures from that. The last thing I say, I'll say is that we're also going to be doing a series over Catholic moral theology. So if you've enjoyed the kind of the moral aspect of this sermon, go ahead and check out the traditional Thomas. You won't be disappointed. All right, everyone, as I like to say on my own show, but I like to say with you guys as well, may our Lord bless you, our Lady keep you, and St. Joseph watch over and protect you. And may St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Alphonsus Liguori pray for us all. God bless. <laughs>